years and it's been my absolute privilege to train and equip so many incredible people and um, I'm so grateful to be here. That's actually fine. Oh, sorry. I thought you were going to, I'm likely to knock it over. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, anyway, where was I? So married for, uh, to, the, to my amazing husband for a very long time now. I won't say because that will give me my age away, but a long time and have three amazing kids and now five grandchildren. They are coming thick and fast and we are thrilled. <laughs> so I tell you what, it's great having grandchildren. It's so much easier than parenting, but it makes parenting well worthwhile when you get these beautiful grandbabies. So it's my absolute privilege to be here. And I just want to thank Pastor Jacob and Mel, who are my good friends. I've known them for many years and you are absolutely so privileged to have them as your senior pastors. They are brilliant people and... Um, I love them to bits, have watched them grow and develop, met them back in the days of Team Challenge. I just want to honour Pastor Malcolm too. You are a hero to me. You're an absolute hero in the faith, Pastor Malcolm. And I honour you for everything that you've done. <laughs> and I know you're going to give Jesus the glory, but it's your faithfulness too to say yes to Jesus continually, trusting him and believing. Look, if you don't know Pastor Malcolm well, you just need to get a coffee and let him t tell s stories of the goodness and the faithfulness of what God has done. And he is witness to many miracles of God, aren't you, Pastor Malcolm? And it has been a privilege of mine to watch him and watch um, Pastor Jacob and Mel grow in the things of God and then step out and be faithful to launch this church and watch now all you beautiful people come and um, commit to what God is doing through this community of faith. And so I, I bring greetings from my senior pastor, which is um, Pastor Izzy and Simone, who have just planted um, Courageous Church up in the northern suburbs. And so for me, being part of a church plant now is very exciting. I was part of Global Heart Church for over 25 years or something. I can't even remember now, a long time. And I have witnessed the faithfulness and the goodness of God and I'm here to encourage you and to champion you to um, trust God, believe God, and then tell the stories of God. So can I pray before we get started? Would that be okay? So let's just pray. <clears throat> Jesus, we love you and we thank you so much for your presence <coughs> here this morning. And God, I just thank you that God, as um, we bring your word, as we come around your word, that God, you would speak to your people. God, I pray this morning won't just be a bunch of stories, but God, you, you would reach in and touch people's hearts. Do what only you can do, God, I pray, that you would transform um, lives, that you would change people's hearts. And God, I pray that as my words go forth, let it not be my words, but let it be yours, Jesus. And God, we commit this time to you in your precious name, Jesus. And everyone said, amen. 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 So about 37 years ago, this will age me as well, I walked into a church very similar to this and encountered Jesus for the first time. Now I went because I felt guilty because I, in a weak moment I'd said yes to my friend about coming to his church. I wasn't really that interested in going to church, but I was, um, you know, when you say yes, then you feel bad because you, if you don't go, you ever, yeah, well, that was me. That's how I ended up in church. And, um, and it was after a big night, if you know what I mean. And John, my husband, said, I'm not going, I, I'm, I'm too hungover. So he slept in, I went. And then I encountered Jesus for the first time. I heard that there was a God in heaven that loved me, that he died on a cross for me so that I could enter into eternal life forever. And from that moment on, when I responded, because I kind of went, I don't really understand what this is all about, but okay, I'll give it a go. And so I put up my hand and in that moment, everything changed for me. Everything changed. I felt, I walked out of church and went, I feel light. I feel, and you know what that was? It was that all my sins had been forgiven and I was carrying a weight that I didn't even realize I was carrying. But in that moment, that weight was lifted. And I came home, I was so excited, I jumped on the bed. I said, John, you've got to come to church. It's so amazing. I've just met Jesus and it's, and he's like, oh my, and he said, oh, Donna, 
Oh, Donna, not another one of your things. <laughs> not another one of your fads. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe it is a fad. I don't know. It was a pretty long fad. Anyway, it's been going for 37 years. <laughs> but anyway, long story short, then um, John eventually came to church and he gave his life to Christ too. And we have been serving God ever since. And there is nothing greater than serving the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He's changed our lives. He's changed the trajectory of our family. He has changed everything. And I can't begin to tell you how good God is. I could talk for hours, story after story after story about how good God is. But I want to share this with you is that a few years ago, John started doing his genealogy. Why? I don't know. I figure that's an old person thing. Sorry if anyone's into genealogy, but no, no judgment. Um, but for me, it felt a bit boring. But anyway, what he discovered was quite profound, though, because we discovered that in, in my history particularly, um, going back generations... There was people that had done incredible things in the name of God that I didn't know about. When I gave my life to Christ, first time I walked into church, I didn't know anybody else who was a Christian. I didn't know my parents weren't Christians, my grandparents weren't Christians. I knew no Christians except for the friend who invited me to church who I've not seen really since. Funny about that. Um, so, but we're going through the genealogy and we discover I have got... Um, relatives of mine not that long ago that in the early 1900s that went from England to China to preach the gospel and died in China. I also discovered that I have relatives that came out from Germany that now have planted churches all up the north coast of Queensland. Who would have thought? But you know what that said to me? Because the scripture says that God is faithful to a thousand generations to those who love him. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In Deuteronomy 7 verse 9, I think we're going to have it come up in a minute. It says this, it says, Therefore know without any doubt and understand that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, who is keeping his covenant and his steadfast loving kindness to a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. Now, I want you to think about this. I have people in my lineage who loved God with all their hearts, enough to go to the other side of the world into a land that was foreign to them to preach the gospel. And God was faithful to them. They died in China, actually, buried there. Um, but someone in my lineage walked away from God and then here I am a few generations later having to discover God again but God is faithful he remembered my past the part does that make sense and he's faithful to a thousand generations I just that blew my mind I thought God you are so good that you hunted me down because of my ancestors so what, so what does that mean for us today? What does that mean for us today? That your faithfulness to God is not just about now. It is about the generations that will come after you. And God is faithful to you. For some of you, you may be thinking, well, you don't understand my story. I've got kids that are away from God or I've got, you know, God knows and he's faithful if we will trust him and pray and believe and remind him that he's faithful to a thousand generations. That is good news for us that God will hunt your kids down. He'll hunt your grandkids down as he hunted me down. Now, I don't, I mean that in the greatest sense, you know, not in a bad way, in a good way, because God loves you. He loves your children. He loves your grandchildren. He loves you. And he cares about you. And so that is such good news. God is so faithful, but we are not. You know, we can trace back to our ancestors that walked away from God. And I, I've often thought about that. I've thought, I wish they'd never walked away. <laughs> I wish they hadn't, because then I would have grown up in a different environment I would have not done some of the dumb things I did that 
created memories, it created pain. Because sin, you know, the, the Bible talks about sin and, and that's just separation from God. And the longer I go on, the more I understand that God doesn't want us to sin, not because he's a big, mean God and you will do as I say. It's because sin hurts us. It hurts us. And so he doesn't want us to get into sin for, because it's going to cause damage. And that's my testimony is that, you know, when I um, did things that were wrong, it hurt me. It hurts me. And so God, that grieves God's heart because he's a loving father that doesn't want us uh, to hurt ourselves. But he's faithful. God is faithful. And, um, you know, so I'm here to remind us of that today, that God is faithful to the generations and he's the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He's the God of not just you. We are very individualistic in our society. We think just about us. But I guess the older you get, the more you realize that it's about the children and the grandchildren and the generations to come after. And so when I first walked into that church as a young girl, very young girl, um, I didn't have any children at that stage. I didn't even, wasn't even thinking about anything but the next party. I was thinking about the next weekend or the next, you know, that's all I was thinking about. Um, but what I've come to realize is that God is so faithful. And my prayer in, in that kind of moment or, or moments after I was in church that first time was, Lord, I just pray for any children I have that they won't do the same things I did because all it did was cause me pain. And I can, I'm standing here to testify that there's a, when you follow Jesus, there's a different life. There's a different life that you can have. And now my children are all serving God, all in the house, all loving God. All my grandchildren are currently in church right as, we, as I'm here. They're in church, another church, not here, but, but they are all worshiping God. And their life is set up differently because of decisions I made, but... Let's not be one of those ones who walk away or get um, distracted. You know, the, the enemy uses his same ploys. He'll distract you, he'll offend you, or he'll, you know, he'll put things in your way that become idols to you more than God. So, and in our society, we've got to watch the love of money or the love of self, the love of those things. They're the things that will distract you from God. And so... Let's not do that. So let's stay faithful to God because God is faithful to us. Unlike my ancestors that walked away and I thought, you know, there have been generations that have died not in God because of their decisions. And I, I, look, I often tell this story because it so, so smacked me in the face when I heard it. Um, so I just want to encourage you. This is a, a strategy that the enemy, and I want to wake you up so that you don't fall for it too. But um, a girlfriend of mine was, you know, I'd met her through basketball. You know, she was a friend and um, she said, oh, yeah, I used to go to church. My par parents used to go to church, and but I don't go now. And then I asked her some stories about that. And it turns out that her grandfather... Um, had got offended because the church decided to spend $700 on carpet and instead of giving it to the poor. I know, that's outrageous, isn't it? But because he got offended, he walked away from God, then his children didn't follow God, and then his grandchildren were now heavily addicted to drugs. This was my friend's children. She was despairing of them. And I thought, I wonder... I wonder that if that grandfather knew what was going to happen in the generations to come after, whether he probably would have paid for the $700 worth of carpet himself for the sake of his children still following God and his grandchildren following God. Don't let offense trip you up because it's not about you, actually. It's about the generations to come after you that may not know what you know. You may walk out, be offended, and still be okay with God. God will still love you. But what about your children? What about your grandchildren? What about your neighbors? What about the people around you that won't hear about the goodness of God because you got offended 
in church or you got distracted or you got uh, had idols that became more important to you. Does that, does that make sense? Let me read Psalm 78 to you. It says this. It says, listen, dear friends, to God's truth. Bend your ears to what I tell you. I'm chewing on the morsel of a proverb and I'll let you in on the sweet old truths. I love the Message Bible or the way it puts it. Stories we've heard from our fathers, counsel we learned at our mother's knee. We're not keeping this to ourselves. We're passing it along to the next generation. God's fame and fortune, the marvellous things he's done. He planted a witness in Jacob and his word firmly in Israel then commanded our parents to teach it to their children so the next generation would know and all the generations to come. Know the truth, tell the stories, so their children can trust in God. Never forget the works of God, but keep his commands to the letter. Heaven forbid they should be like their parents, bullheaded and bad, a fickle and faithless bunch who never stray true to God. The scripture here says, tell the stories to the generations. You know what? I, I want to encourage us that we need to open our mouths. Often we are too quiet. We don't tell our stories. I started off by telling you the stories of, I mean, as we were worshipping Pastor Chin, I was, I was just remembering the goodness of God over my generation. Now, there is going to be more stories to tell as the generations go on. But I was sitting here thinking, what can I share about the goodness of God? And I've got story after story after story. And Pastor Malcolm, I bet you've got a hundred stories of the goodness of God. And you know what? When I first got saved, I didn't have very many stories. But I tell you what, when I walked out that building and I felt light, I had a story that I could share about the goodness of God. And so we need to tell our stories. You know, some of us feel like our testimony is not that great. You know, we sort of feel like, well, unless I've been a drug addict and on the street and, um, you know, come in and then I get radically saved, I don't, yeah, I don't have a story. That is not true. The day you decided to follow Jesus if you have decided, and if you haven't, I'm going to pray for you later. But if you have decided to follow Jesus, you have been radically transformed, that you have been changed, you have been translated from death into life. Do you know that we are not often, we don't often talk about heaven and hell in church. I think we should bring that back, but we should talk a little bit more about heaven and hell. Because you have been rescued because of what Jesus did on the cross for, with, you know, from an eternity without God. And now, even when we say that, it's like, oh, whatever. Okay. At least all my friends will be there. We need to get a better revelation or a biblical theology on hell. Because if you know what you've been rescued from, you will not be able to keep your mouth shut and you will be telling every single person you know because you will recognize your pe the people that you love in your world that unless they get a revelation of Jesus, where their eternity is. And it's not very cool. It's terrible. So we need to get a revelation and then we need to tell our stories. You have been changed, radically changed, and now you're in Christ. All your sins are forgiven. That is such good news, don't you think? But I want to encourage us, tell your children. So for those of you that are young, that have young children, tell of the goodness of God always. You know, I remember raising my children, um, you know, and I'd be always telling them what it was like not to know Jesus, because they'd never really experienced that. They just knew about Jesus. And so I would tell them about it. I would say, you're not missing anything when you're out in the world clubbing. You're not missing a thing. Trust me, being there, done that. Nothing there. Nothing. 
you know, I'd tell them how God would rescued us when we were, you know, financially struggling and God came through. I would tell the stories, tell your story, tell of what God's done. And can I encourage you, I'm still, we still are telling our story to our grandchildren now. Every opportunity we get, we're telling them about how good God is. Um, my daughter is married to um, another, uh, Phil, so for some of you might know Pastor Phil and Sue Ayres, some won't. But anyway, they're pastors in our, have been pastors in our state, wonderful people. Well, my eldest daughter married their eldest son. And so there's generation actually of pastors now in this, in this, their lineage. So I'm talking to my grandsons. I'm saying, you come from a line of people that have served God and God has been faithful and God will be faithful to you. Does that, does that make sense? Just whatever is the story that you've got, tell it because, um, this is what the scripture says. We need to remind our children. If you don't have children, tell the, your family. I remember talking to my parents. Do you know my parents didn't give their lives to Christ for 20 years. I would say for 20 years before they gave their life to Christ. And I would just tell them about how good God was and what God was doing in my life. I'm sure they thought I was weird, but that's okay. I didn't care. Um, and you know what? Now they're following Jesus and they're radically changed. Like even my children said, Grandma and Grandy are different, Mum. I said, that's right, because they've given their life to Christ now. So that, the yeah, lots changed for them, which was so exciting. I say that to say too, I prayed, I fasted, I cried over them because I didn't want them to end up in eternity in hell. And I thought, God, will you please... I don't care if it's on their deathbed, just let them get saved. That was all the faith I had, just little faith. <laughs> but you know what? God radically saved them. My mum was in Bible college with my kids, with me. That was crazy too. Fancy being the principal and your mum's in the class and your kids are in the class. That was a weird camp that year. But anyway, <laughs> God is so good. So tell, tell the stories. I don't know how long I've got, so you better tell, wind me up if I go too long. <laughs> Number two. Capture moments, you know, build memorials. The Bible talks about building memorials of faith. And I'm just going to read in Joshua where, where God tells the people of Israel to build a, a memorial. And it's in Joshua chapter 4, verse 4 to 7. It says, Joshua called out the 12 men whom he'd selected from the people of Israel, one man from each tribe. Joshua directed them Cross to the middle of the Jordan and take your place in front of the chest of God, your God. Each of you heft a stone to your shoulder, a stone for each of the tribes of the people of Israel. So you'll have something later to mark the occasion. When your children ask you, what are these stones for? You'll say the flow of the Jordan was stopped in front of the chest of the covenant of God as it crossed the Jordan, stopped in its tracks. These stones are a permanent memorial for the people of Israel. God knew that we as humans have shocking memories, <laughs> that we forget. We forget what God has done. We forget the goodness of God. And so God says here to, to Joshua, stop, put a bunch of stones, get the people to put a bunch of stones. And every time you walk past here, tell the story, tell what happened. And we see that even in the, in the New Testament, in Matthew 26, 6 to 13, we see when Jesus was at Bethany, a guest of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him as he was eating dinner and anointed him with a bottle of very expensive perfume. When the disciples saw what was happening, they were furious. That's criminal. There's that offense. This could have been sold for a lot and the money handed out to the poor. And when Jesus realized what was going on, he intervened. Why are you giving this woman a hard time? She has just done something wonderfully significant for me. You have the poor with you every day for the rest of your lives, but not me. And when she poured this perfume out on my body, what she really did was anoint me for burial. You can be sure that whatever, whenever in the whole world the message is preached, what she has just done is going to be remembered and admired. And here we are thousands of years later, remembering and admiring that this woman poured out everything. I mean, there's a whole sermon in that, just that scripture alone. But she poured out everything and, she, and God said, remember this 
and she will be remembered and the story will be told of how she radically worshipped her saviour. Now, what memorials are you setting up in your life? Do you have memorials? Do you have memorials? You know, when we first got saved, I remember your message was great about tithing too. I'm glad I'm not your kids. <laughs> would be upset about that 10 percent of that ice cream but anyway <laughs> um, but good principles good to good to teach kids that so um anyway where was i about memorials we i remember the first time we started learning to tithe and trusting god i remember the first time um i gave ten dollars that was big for me i'm just saying but that was big it's like whoa put 10 bucks in the bucket Will I ever get that back? You know, like I was looking, I'm looking for the angles. How do I get this back? <laughs> but I remember going, well, God, I'm trusting you. You said in your word, so I'll put the 10 bucks in, but it better come back to me. And you know what? God is so good because he's such a loving father that he was teaching me that he was good. And then I can't even remember properly the story, but I remember we got money back and I was like, this works. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> wrong heart wrong motive but i was learning i was a new christian right i didn't know i didn't know anything but i've learned about the faithfulness of god in our giving and so we would you know i'm telling the story about how when we first gave and how god was faithful to us and then we learned to trust more and then god has never let us down i can tell story after story even how god has provided for us so you know memorials are important write them down Write down the things that God does for you so you can remember, so that you can tell your children or tell people around you what God has done. Do you know the great cathedrals in Europe and around the place um, are great memorials to the faithfulness of people's giving, aren't they? If you think about some of those cathedrals that were were has anyone been to europe and seen some of those amazing cathedrals some people yes i haven't been yet but i grew up in geraldton and there's a beautiful cathedral in geraldton and you know that it's a testimony to people just like you and me that are faithfully given to glorify god and in europe there's people that started building those cathedrals knowing full well that their children and their grandchildren may never see the completion of that building. Imagine having that sort of faith and insight to see something glorify God that you knew in your generation you wouldn't even see the completion of it. Wow. Wow. What type of people were they? What type of people were they that had the faith to see a building started that would take generations to complete would take millions and millions of dollars in our in our money to complete but yet they wanted to glorify God and I know you guys are in a building fund is that right or you're you're starting a building fund because you're about to move into another building can I just encourage you get in get on board with that you are sowing into a legacy that not just for you, yes, you will, you know, it will be nice. You'll probably have heating. You'll probably have nice things in there. You know, all those things are important, right? Um, they're, they're all important. But it's not just about that. I want you to lift your eyes and see that you are planting a church in a community that needs the hope of the gospel, that needs a place for people to come to find home, find community, find hope, find healing, find all those things, and that you are sowing into that. And it's not just about you, although you will enjoy some nice things, I'm sure. But I want to encourage you, have the mind of Christ, have the mind of a visionary who can see that in generations to come, maybe even after you're gone, people will find hope there and that you would have sown into that. And your name may never be recognized on this side of the planet, on this side of heaven, but it will be recognized in heaven. And so we have to shift our perspective a little bit and think a little bit bigger so create memorials in your own life but be part of creating memorials for other people as well 
And now for me now, I'm very passionate in my, you know, latter years of serving Jesus, Pastor Malcolm, <laughs> I want to see many churches planted. I want to see the state of WA thriving with many churches and I want to raise leaders to plant more churches so that we can see the kingdom of God go forward. We can see people find hope like I did as a young girl all those years ago, walking in with no hope, full of fear, full of anxiety, full of um, pain and sin. And, and I know the trajectory of where my life would have ended up except for Jesus because he interrupted arrested me and changed my life forever and the generations that come after me. My son said the other day to me, oh, mum, you know, our life would have been pretty okay without, without um, Jesus. I said, uh, 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 let me just tell you what your life would have been like if your mother had not got saved. Let me tell you what your mother would be like. And as I told him, he went, yeah, okay, mum, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. Thank you, Jesus. So... Live with eternity in mind. In Colossians 3 verse 1 to 2 it says, So if you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground. Absorb, absorbed with the things right in front of you. Look up and be alert to what God is, uh, is going on around Christ. It's what, that's where the action is. See things from God's perspective. Can I just encourage you, we need to have God's perspective. He is faithful. He is good. He cares about you. He cares about your generations and the generations who come after you. He cares about the people in your world. But we have to have God's perspective. And so we need to look to Jesus, get his perspective, and then change. Because it's, so, you know, it's so easy to go into our Mondays, isn't it, and just... Get distracted. And I'm speaking to myself. And we can get distracted about and forget the goodness of God. And that's why we need memorials, constant reminders of how good God is. And I just want to encourage you, we need to not keep this to ourselves. We need to open our mouths and tell the story. Do you know what? You don't, um, you don't have to be perfect. You don't even have to be good. At telling your story sometimes we can look at people you might look at me and go oh that's great for you but you're really good at speaking no I'm not I'm just passionate about Jesus and I trust that the Holy Spirit is with me is going to help me as I open my mouth I get just as nervous as everybody else about sharing my story but I don't want to hold on to what God has done in my life and keep it to myself I want to get it out there because it's pretty selfish if I keep it to myself how good God has been to me. Because everybody needs to hear about the goodness of God. And so I want to encourage you that in your tomorrow and your Tuesday and your Wednesday and your Thursday, what are you going to do? I want you to re remind yourself of how good God's been. If you need to write it down, write it down. Create memorials. And then tell people. Tell people about the goodness of God. Tell your work colleagues about what God has done. Don't keep it to yourself. Get it out there. Is that okay? Yeah. We have to be intentional to open our mouth. Now, I've got a good friend. Um, I used to hate going shopping with her because every time we'd stopped at a checkout or anywhere, she would tell people about how good Jesus was. It's like, can we just finish shopping you know but I but I was challenged by it too because I thought this person may never encounter Jesus again except for for me and if I keep it to myself then this person may never get the opportunity to hear about the goodness of God so I would love to pray for two things today if that's okay one, I would like to pray for you, for those of you that know Jesus, but you maybe haven't been telling your story sufficiently or enough. I want to pray that we'd be bold, that the Holy Spirit would fill you, give you boldness. The book of Acts talks about that. 
um, I'd, I'd like to encourage you or challenge you to read about Peter, how Peter ran away when Jesus died on the cross. He ran away, he went all the way back to the Galilee because he was afraid and with probably good reason if you put yourself in his position. Good reason to be afraid because the Romans were after them and so were the Jewish people. But yet we find ourselves a couple of chapters later in the book of Acts, all of a sudden he's preaching to over 3,000 people responded to the gospel. What happened between that and that? What happened was the Holy Spirit was poured out and then they were boldly witnessing. So I want to pray for you. If you don't know Jesus, and perhaps if everyone could bow their heads just to give people privacy. You know, if you've been listening to what I've been saying and you're like, I don't understand a word you're going on about. Um, but there's something in you, like me, when I first went to church that day, I'd never heard about, never encountered God before or church before. But there was something there was something in me that went, if this is true, if there is a God in heaven that loves me, if there's a God in heaven that cares that much about me, then I want to know. I want to know about that. And if that's you, if you think, yeah, I would like to know about that, then just quickly raise your hand and, and no one's looking around. And if you'd like to start to explore what faith might mean, then I'd love to pray with you and, and perhaps meet with you afterwards and just start to share some stories with how you can meet Jesus and begin a relationship. So if that's you, I'd just love you to raise your hand. I'd love to pray with you. If that's you, if you don't know God and you're like, gosh, I'd like to know about this God that you're talking about. I'd like to know about this Jesus. If that's you, I'd like you to raise your hands. Awesome. Well, I'm going to assume that we're all good with God today. And the second group of people I want to pray for, and perhaps if you can stand and can we sing that song, Witness, again? Would that be all right? Um, I just thought God was so funny when this song came out. We didn't talk about what songs we were going to sing, didn't we? No, no we didn't. Um, but we need to be a witness to the goodness of God. And we need to tell our stories. And so um, I wonder, I'd like to pray for anyone who wants prayer actually anyone that says I'm ch I'm feeling convicted I'm feeling yes I need to be more of a witness I need to tell people more about what I'm doing but you feel scared that's okay I, I understand that um, but if that's you if you want to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to tell people about um, Jesus then I'd like to pray for you so perhaps if we can sing and if you want to come down the front we'll we'll pray maybe Pastor Chin you can pray as well um, but let me just finish off. We're just going to pray and then we're going to invite you to come forward. So God, we just thank you so much for your word. I thank you, God, that your word is powerful. And that God, it changes people's lives. And God, I thank you that you've encouraged us this morning to just be a witness to you, to tell our stories, to pass it on to our children so that generations will know of your goodness. God, I pray that there won't be... Um, yeah, any breaks in generations here, but God, the generations that come after everyone here will continue to worship you, continue to honor you, lift your name, Jesus, because you are so worthy. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness towards us. God, we thank you for each and every person here. God, I pray your blessing, your favor, your anointing over every single person. And God, I pray in their week this week, that they would tell someone about how good you are, whether it's their children, their children's children, their neighbors, God, the people they work with. God, I pray, give them opportunity to open their mouths and say, God has been so good to me. Let me tell you what God has done. So God, I thank you for that. In your mighty name, Jesus. And everyone said, amen, amen. Let's just sing. And if you want prayer, come forward. When I was lost,